This is Raul Lopez, and you're listening to How Do You Say Success in Spanglish. The path to success isn't easy. For minorities and people of color, many attempt the journey with little to no guidance. Join me as I sit down with individuals who share their stories of perseverance so that together we can learn how to say success in Spanglish. What's good, mi gente? It's your boy Raul. Welcome back. Uh, today on the show, I got a good friend of mine, George Torres. How's it going, George? Que pasa? I'm good, man. Thank you for having me. Oh, no, thank you. I appreciate you being here. Uh, just to kind of tell you a little bit about George. Um, George is a digital storytelling community builder. Um, George is an award-winning dynamic storyteller, producer, workshop facilitator, change agent, and social media visibility consultant who passionately elevates Latino culture. With a strong focus on preserving and promoting our heritage, George works tirelessly to raise awareness about brands and initiatives that celebrate the richness of Latino culture. Driven by a lifelong disappointment in the absence of Latino stories from history textbooks, George embarked on a journey inspired by the potential of new media and his grandmother's community work. In 1997, he created Sofrito for Your Soul, the first Latino storytelling website dedicated to celebrating our history and providing context to our legacy. George aims to create a future where Latino stories are cherished, celebrated, and firmly woven into the fabric of our collective history. George, welcome to the show. Gracias, gracias. Yeah, man. Uh, that's that's awesome, man. I, I really appreciate it. And, you know, you were uh, very supportive of me as well when I when I started this journey as well. Uh, and so I, I can see firsthand, you know, that you, you like to get your fingers involved and make sure that the, the stories are being told and, and being presented. So I, once uh, for, for me personally, just to start off, I want to thank you for, you know, guiding me and helping me out uh, through this process as well. So it's been really, really helpful. So, um, but to kind of start off, I guess we'll start off with you, you know, tell me, you know, who is George? I mean, uh, so many different things. So el hijo de Carmen y el nieto de Gloria. Mm-hmm. So foremost. So, uh, that's how I like to frame it. I'm just a regular person who is trying to build things that weren't available for me when I was younger. That's kind of that's kind of where I stand in the space right now. Is you know just me trying to be a solution or like they like Gandhi said, be the change. Yeah, and like it's it's great you mentioned that you know stuff that we didn't have. So you grew up in in New York. So tell me a little bit about life growing up in New York. So I grew up in Brooklyn, in East New York, Brooklyn, uh, in the middle of the 80s. So, you know, the crack epidemic in New York, uh, very, very hard times in general. Um, I am uh, the urban, the name Urban Hibado kind of like, I existed in two spaces at once. So I existed in Brooklyn, New York, and also in Puerto Rico. So I got like the best experiences from both, right? I was street savvy, but then I also had a very firm grasp on culture and tradition. So that kind of like weaves into like my whole persona online, et cetera. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's part of who I am. It's really who I am. It's just like, it's that old school street savvy dude that actually knows where he comes from uh, and is constantly learning more about that every single day. Yeah. I mean, for me growing up, I, I think a lot of it was a battle between my, like you call yourself the urban hero, you know, for me, the urban life I'm living versus my, Latino culture and what I was living at home Um, and I grew up we did have you know Dominican Puerto Ricans and stuff like that but I was like early on I was really I wanted to be more black than I was Latino I I cared more about black culture than Latino culture and not say I don't care about black culture but I still care about black culture but you know I was really ingrained into the black urban culture that I grew up in Uh, and then when I got older I got into um, uh, more involved with my Latino culture and who I was as a Peruvian American here. So did you ever feel you were battling uh, who you were growing up? Well, it's interesting you say that because I grew up in Brownsville in East New York, and it was a very mixed community. Um, There weren't too many other cultures other than just Black and Puerto Rican Mm -hmm. at the time, right? Some Dominican, but almost no Central South American, Mexican. It was Puerto Rican dominant at the time. I, too, had that same type of identity crisis. You know, prior to me having my cultural awakening, um, you know, I definitely hung out with everybody in the community was African-American, right? And when I was in Brownsville, when I went to East New York, it diversified a little bit, but I always felt very comfortable in Black spaces, right? 
Um, and, and one of the really interesting things about the time that I grew up in is that we didn't have a big racial divide when it came to Blacks and Puerto Ricans. It didn't matter what complexion you were. If you were Puerto Rican, you were Puerto Rican and you were one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they didn't alienate you. I recently um, had an interview with somebody uh, out in Europe. Somebody interviewed me uh, from a European radio station and they asked me um, how I felt about that, about that whole process of growing up in a black neighborhood. And if I felt, if I ever felt like I was victimized because of my race and I've never been victimized as a young person, I wasn't victimized because I was Puerto Rican or white passing. I was victimized because kids were assholes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really, at the end of the day, that's what it was, right? Um, I was victimized, however, by white people. I was victimized by the police brutality. I was victimized by the system just because I was Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. and because I was obviously living my my truth right i was living as a puerto rican I, I was very i was starting to learn about my culture i was in, engulfed in hip-hop culture as it was developing here in new york um so i got i got racially profiled for that not for my skin complexion which is a very interesting and different take when you actually look at it based on what's happening today yeah it's uh i mean i i, I think it's hard to find uh people of color who may not have ever experienced and if they haven't that's wonderful you know but i think a lot of us have at some point in time felt you know we were outcast or or, or looked down upon or you know, the typical being followed at the supermarket or the store because you know what you look like and uh, think about this i got blue eyes man yeah I'm, i look white and i have blue eyes and i still got racially profiled but it was more of a cultural thing right it was mm -hmm. what i was wearing it was how i was talking it was who i was hanging out with so being, being that close and adjacent to Black culture actually is what got me victimized, not the people who are next to me that look very different from me. Like, you know, so I have nothing but love for the Black community because they showed me mad love when I was growing up. Yeah, no, same thing. Bro. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it, and I think it's always funny too, I, when I take like a, a, a trip or a vacation or something like that, and you're you're on like something and there's all these random people everywhere. And it's like, some. I remember we went to, uh, uh, Puerto Vallarta for our honeymoon and we're on a, a boost cruise driving around going to an island for this event and uh, like a whole bunch of white people I think I was like one of the only Latinos on the boat and there was like one black couple of course that's who we went to right away you know we we talked to them we spent the whole night hanging out and talking or whatever because you know there was a a, a quick and common bond there that that occurred so you know it, I think it helps you out and it influences us in, in a way but um you know, speaking of influences, you, know, you you talk about the influence your grandmother gave you. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your grandma and how she influenced your life? Oh, man, my grandmother, um, Gloria del Rio. Um, she uh, came here when my mom was born. So my mom was a newborn. Uh, she came here to, to, like many Puerto Ricans did at the time, to find a better life. Uh, she came to New York with my mom in her arms with little to no money in her pocket. She didn't have much more than a high school education. Um, she came here to, to, to expand her horizon. Um, fast forward, she ended up going to Boricua College, ended up getting a master's in social work from Hunter at CUNY. And she eventually became a, a champion for the elderly in North Brooklyn, which encompasses uh, Brownsville, East New York, and Bushwick. So she was a champion uh, politically for the rights of elderly. Uh, she uh, was the founding director of Meals on Wheels, which is a, a program that uh, that provides hot meals, hot nutritious meals for uh, uh, the elderly homebound. Um, and she was, you know, she was just a political firecracker, like in the whole community. She was uh, involved in the different tenant rights associations living in NYCHA. NYCHA is New York City Housing Authority. Uh, we were one of the first Puerto Rican families in the projects we grew up in. Um, so my grandmother was, you know, she was she was somebody of the people, you know. And um, I spent a lot of time with my mom, or with my grandmother, because my mom wasn't able to take care of me uh, for some time. So I spent a lot of time with her in the kitchen. I was always fascinated with her cooking. It always smells so good. And uh my grandmother doesn't make much of a secret of this uh, when she was alive. She uh, she used to say I was her favorite. I was her first grandson. So so I had the, the label of being her favorite. Um, so I was pretty much the only one that was allowed to sit with her in the kitchen. 
you know, how the grandmothers be like, sat la cocina, you know. So uh, on very rare occasion, not always, but I would be allowed to sit with her, help her, and even have conversations with her. And I would ask her, so I would interview her, like almost every single time I had a chance to sit with her, uh, either on the rocking chair or in the, uh, or in the kitchen. And I would just ask her questions and she would put me on to so many different things. She would talk to me about the civil rights movement. She would talk to me about Puerto Rico. She would talk to me about some of the uh, political uprisings in, in, in La Isla. She would talk to me about people like Pedro Abizu Campos and Eugenio Maria de Hostos. She would, she would just give me such a wide range of things that I was super disappointed that I wasn't learning in school. Uh, you know, I don't even think Puerto Rico was mentioned at all, unless it was in the guise of like sugar cane. And it was mentioned as a country that provides sugar to the country. But I don't think that Puerto Rico ever came up in class, you know, mm -hmm. until I was in college. Um, so she, 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 it was, it was classroom. It was a classroom. Like her kitchen was a classroom. And then her cooking was a whole other thing because she was a very kind person. She would always make more food than we needed at home so that we could bring some to neighbors, so that we could have food available if people came to visit. So I had been, we had different dinner guests almost every single night, which is, is crazy. And the, her pot, her olla that she used to use for her, her big, big stock pot, right? Whenever she made soup or whatever, it was like, it was almost like a miracle, right? It never ran out of soup. Like no matter how much she cooked and no matter how many people were in the house, it always seemed like there was enough. I don't remember ever anybody saying there's no more food left. So it was just a very magical time for me. And this is my recollection. This is, you know, me romanticizing it in mm -hmm. some ways, but, but that's what I remember. I remember like just having enough for everybody and just, you know, that compassion, that compassion above everything. She, she definitely wanted to feed the world. And, and is that, for her work. Yeah. And is that, that's kind of what influenced you to be, to, to do the work you do now? It did, but in a different way, right? First, I was fascinated with her cooking. So I, my first career was, I was a chef. You know, I, I worked in a kitchen at a seafood restaurant in Queens. And then I eventually moved over to Marriott where I became an executive sous chef uh, for uh, Merrill Lynch headquarters. So at first it was cooking. I was really into cooking. I liked making people happy. I liked feeding people. Um, but uh, down the line, I ended up getting divorced. I was, I was married really young. I was a young father at 16. I ended up getting divorced and I decided to go back to college. And when I went back to college, that opened up a whole new world for me. Like that, that, that just blew my whole world open um, because I saw that people were actively engaging in social justice conversations. I started seeing people talk about some of the people that I knew from the community that were doing big things. And they were shocked that I knew who they were. And I was able to bring them to campus and, 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 and engage with them in, in public discourse. Um, so college really shifted my, my energy. You know, I decided that I didn't want to be working in a kitchen on, on weekends and holidays. I felt that my, my life as a chef actually contributed to my divorce because I wasn't home enough. And I just decided to go a whole different route. So going back to school was huge for me because I had dropped out of high school to become a young dad, went back to high school, got my my diploma, and then you know obviously went to college a little bit late in life. I went at, at the age of twenty five, uh, already a dad of two, you know. So it was uh, it was an interesting journey, but definitely a necessary one. So you mentioned you um, dropped out of high school and then went back to uh, college and started college at twenty five with two kids, which is obviously that's a lot <laughs> on your plate. Uh, uh, so tell me a little bit about that journey and, and um, what made you want to go back to school. So, so first of all, when I was in high school, before I dropped out, I had no direction. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a good student. I got good grades. I had behavior problems, but they were mostly due to the fact that I was really bored in school. You know, like I, I would, I would ace everything except math. Like I would, I would, I would get great grades in, in everything, every class. I was a good writer. But I was really, really, like I said, very engulfed in hip hop culture at the time. And, uh, and I found my sweet spot in, in the graffiti arts. So I, I spent a lot of time drawing and painting and I would do it in class and get in trouble for it, that kind of stuff. Um, so I dropped out at 16, 17, didn't have much more, much more to go, but 
I ended up having to go to work to to support uh, my daughter. Um, and what ended up what ends up happening at that point is I become really, really engaged in the streets in a lot of different ways, right? And I don't think we need to go into detail, but uh, you know, I get I get very very involved with the streets, even more so than I was in, in high school. And uh, and then there came a point, you know, somewhere around 20, I think I had my my son at that point. Once I had my son, I saw that I needed to make some changes. You know, my relationship was failing. You know, I felt like my family was in danger at certain points because of some of the stuff I was involved in. And I made a choice. I made a choice to, to you know, course correct. Unfortunately, my relationship didn't get saved. When I got divorced, I ended up, you know, being in a situation where, okay, now I got to figure out life. And the divorce actually launched me right into college. I went to go visit. Um, I went to go visit a young lady I was dating, and she invited me to one of the fraternity, like one of those cultural nights for Alianza Latina at SUNY Westbury. And the people that were talking about were people who were mentors to me. You know, I had a, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that at some point. But I had a cultural awakening uh, when I was attacked in 1986 as a uh, Puerto Rican and, and with my Dominican friend, uh, the people who helped me with that case, the people who helped me through that, that legal uh, proceeding uh, were civil rights leaders like Richie Perez, uh, Yoruba, uh, Pablo Guzman, um, people from the New York, uh, from the New York Puerto Rican civil rights uh, movement. And uh, that was, uh, that's what, that's who they were talking about. They were talking about the Brooklyn College protest. They were talking about the Puerto Rican flag being hung from the Statue of Liberty. And I'm just like, I know who did that. Like, you know, like yeah. I knew these people and they were personal friends and personal mentors because of what had happened uh, to me in Howard Beach. So I had the opportunity to reach out to them and reconnect with them to bring them to the college. And, and that made me a superstar, but, but not so much, maybe a superstar on campus, but I wasn't even going there. So I had people believing for like six months. I actually went to college there and I <laughs> ended up saying, I don't go here. Yeah. And then the girl that I was dating was like, but you can't. Yeah. She's like, you're educating people now. You don't have a degree. You're from the streets and you're coming here and you're schooling people on different things about civil rights and whatnot. You should be here. That means that you're good enough to be here. And she really pushed me and, and, and shout out to her and Myrna Noble. She, she, she really pushed me and, uh, and helped me with the paperwork and she explained financial aid to me and she, like, she spent countless hours helping me through the process and I enrolled. I moved out of my apartment. I moved in uh, to a friend's house, uh, her, one of her friend's house, her best friend, uh, offered me a, a spot on the couch so that I could manage the gap between my lease expiring and, and going to college. And, uh, and the rest is history, man. I, I, I you know, I, I, I completely threw myself into college life, even with my kids. My kids used to get babysat by sorority girls on the days that I had to have them. I had them on campus. I snuck them in my room. I mean, it was, you know, I used to go to the calf and load up in, in Tupperware to bring food to the room for the kids because I, you know, we didn't have a kitchen. I mean, it was a very interesting and very, very uh, hard journey in that sense. But the people who helped me became my frat brothers. They became my best friends. Some of them have collaborated with me over the last 20 something years. So it was a beautiful journey. And, and I, I have a lot of great memories and a lot of good friends from that, from that process. Yeah, that's awesome, man. That's, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, I'm glad to hear that, you know, that it was a positive change. And, uh, you know, I think it's interesting the way you put it, where she was like, you're, 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 you're schooling people and you're, um, you're educating people. You're you you you're good enough to be here. Did you ever feel like you weren't going to college because you weren't good enough to go? Dude, my my I never had a conversation with my counselor about college. I I didn't even know what college was. My high school counselor, Mr. Smith, once told me that I would not live to see the age of 21. That I would either be dead or locked up. Hmm. I want, I want to put that in real perspective. And I have a beautiful story about how I, 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 I showed him different. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, so he told me that I would not see the age of 21. I'm 52 today. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, so I'm, I'm proud of that. 
I'm proud of my journey. I'm proud of what I've lived, what I've endured. But most importantly, I'm proud that I did not become the statistic that he thought I was. I'm the antithesis of everything that he thought I would be. That's crazy, man. I mean, I think counselors sometimes will try to do like hard truth to get people to change sometimes or and then but we also a lot of us just fall through the crowd. I don't you know, I don't think we especially in, in in the schools we go to, you know, they're poor, underfunded. Not everybody's gonna get the focus. The they might focus on the five kids on the top and ignore the rest of the kids. And I think for a lot of us we don't get the support, um, you know, and any advice or you know, counseling to to kind of get where you are. And I think it, it it fails us at the end because we just keep continuing, you know, to a downward spiral on that. So um so so what was the what was that um how did you prove to your counselor you said you you went back and you did prove to him? So yeah, so um this was uh when I was working in the restaurant business. I was working at a, at a seafood restaurant called London Lenny's in Queens. And I'm walking into work one day. I'm running a little a hot out, right? A little bit in the rush. And I'm getting ready to open up the door. So I open the door for this old man that's walking in. And he looks up at me. He says, Mr. Torres. <laughs> oh, arrogant voice. Like, I just hated his voice. And I look at him. I say, oh, Mr. Smith, how you doing? And he's like, what are you doing here? Now, mind you, this restaurant is a very expensive seafood restaurant. This restaurant's an institution in Queens. And I'm like, I work here. And then he's like, oh, look at that. You know, he's like kind of nodding his head and whatever. So he's like, well, let me not keep you. Those pots are probably stacking up in the back. <laughs> Jeez. I was so tight. I was so tight. I can't even tell you what I wanted to do, but I just let it rock. And I went into the back. While I'm in the back, I cried. I cried for like a good 10 minutes. His order came in. I did his order and whatever. And I just had something in me. I was like, I got to do this the right way. I can't solve these problems the way I used to solve these problems. So I tell my assistant manager at the time, the guy that manages the kitchen, I told him, I said, do me a favor. I want you to get a very expensive bottle of wine and I want you to send it out to the table, compliments of the chef. So I send this bottle out to him, right? So he's happy, he gets the bottle and you know, I heard that, you know, I'm watching him through the window and he's like smiling or whatever. He's like, oh, tell the chef to come out. I would love to talk to him, whatever. So I come out in my uniform, like I'm sharp, man. I'm like, I made sure I was clean, boom, apron, everything. And I come outside and he looks at me and he just takes the bottle like this and puts it on the table. He's like, I'll pay for it, but you can keep it. That's how arrogant this dude was. Jeez. So I almost lost my job that day because mm -hmm. he was a regular customer that came in every week. And obviously he complained to my manager that I, that I insulted him. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted him to know, like, I was not the power washer. I'm yeah. the guy that food. And the food that you come here and eat every single week, I'm the one that actually prepares the food, you know. And that, that to me, for me, it was such a big step. It was such a, it was like a catalyst for me because it was like, I'm not solving problems the way I used to solve them. Mm -hmm. Actually, you did something and I was very intelligent and measured about how I did it, but I still gave him the message. I let him know who I was and who I became. And and to think that guy counsels kids, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like with that yeah. level of, that level of. I mean, he's no longer with us, um, but yeah, I definitely, uh, it's one of those things where you kind of like, I hate that he did that to me, and I hate that he did that to many people, but I'm glad that I was able to prove him wrong and that he knows that he was wrong. Yeah, amen to that. But, you know, but yeah, we have to definitely look, keep a lookout for people like that, that are in our kids' lives and, and, and the people that we love's lives, because that, that could be very damaging. And some people make that a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned earlier um, that you had a cultural awakening. Is that the word? Yeah, yeah. cultural awakening. Cultural awakening. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So in 1986, me and a Dominican friend of mine were attacked in a predominantly white area of Queens, South Ozone Park, and uh, were almost killed. You know, uh, and uh, so many details, but I'll be honest with you, I, I have, I struggle with telling the story because it's very emotional to me. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the cultural awakening kind of stems from the fact that the same night, the same exact thing happened to an African-American family not far away. 
uh, and it was known as the Howard Beach incident. It was one of those big cases like Trayvon Martin type of like it was a big the city was uh, it was a big uproar. It was all over the news and whatnot. Michael Griffith, rest in peace, was uh, was killed uh, when he was trying to come. He came to Queens to buy a car and uh, and he walked into a pizzeria to get help or to find out where he can get help to because his car wouldn't start. And uh, he got chased by a bunch of uh, Italian Americans with baseball bats. And he was chased into the Cross Bay, uh, what is it, Cross Bay Boulevard, and was hit by a car. Um, we also got attacked in a similar fashion. My friend had a gash in the back of his head from a pipe. Um, one of the worst things that happened to us is that at the very end of the chase, we ended up jumping into a coffee shop and the coffee shop was owned by people from that community and they kicked us out of the coffee shop. And uh, as they kicked us out of the coffee shop, the cops rolled up and instead of grabbing the guys that actually attacked us, they actually threw me and my friend up against the wall, even though he was bleeding in the back of the head, even though, you know, and we were asked, why were we in that neighborhood? And um, I don't know, man. It's 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 heavy. It's a heavy it's a heavy thing to talk about. But yeah. but what I realized was that um, a couple of different things. One, I had a deeper understanding of what I heard in the black community when people talked about police brutality. I understood a little bit more about that um, because even though we weren't profiled specifically for the color of our skin, we were definitely profiled. I would say we were culturally profiled because we definitely didn't belong in the neighborhood based on the way we were dressed. But I understood a deeper meaning of what it means to be profiled, mm -hmm. right? I also had a deeper understanding of, under like understanding of like, I thought the police were there to help. And I felt safe when I saw them to then have that trust betrayed. So that was another piece of it. And then last but not least, I don't think that I've ever encountered hate in that way before. Because like I said, I had my share of fights when I was in school, you know, so I, I, you know, I had uh, experience with conflict, but I never had conflict that was just based on the fact that I was different. And that to me was very eye-opening. And, and I remember going back to my grandmother after this was, you know, a couple of days after this happened and just asking her like, why do they hate us? Like, why? Like, why do they hate us? And, um, and that to me was very introspective. And she talked to me, I think she focused with me on Puerto Rican history. She focused on the fact that, uh, all the different things related to the reasons why we were even in New York in the first place. She talked to me about the different social justice issues that we had in the United States, New York specifically, uh, with housing, with, with work discrimination, with everything. Like she just gave me a whole like cross section of Puerto Rican history, but she talked about the really bad stuff. And, and that to me was like, that made me want to learn more about my culture. That made me want to learn more about who I was. It made me want to learn more about my great grandparents. It made me want to learn more about the freedom fighters. It made me want to learn more about the young lords. It made me want to, you know, especially because the young lords were the ones that were actually handling my case. Mm -hmm. I'm literally, I'm, I'm talking to my grandmother about stuff. And then I'm actually walking in a room to go to court with lawyers that are the people she's talking about. And that to me was such a like, there's people out here trying to make a difference and to make sure that people don't get away with making our lives disposable. And that really appealed to me. You know, I'm somebody who, who when I was young, I watched Scarface and The Godfather and idolized the big hustlers on the block. You know, I, I, I went through that phase and, 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 and now I'm seeing like positive images of Latino men that are actually doing things to make a difference. And that really drew me in. You know, Richie took me under his, Richie Perez, uh, one of the founding uh, young lords, took me under his wing and he just like, he schooled me. And he's the one that actually named me Urban Hero. 
he's the one that said, dude, you're the best of both. He's like, you literally, you're like a, you're like a street savvy kid that just has all the culture and the heritage just instilled in your DNA. And, um, when he passed away some years later, I actually adopted Urban Hirado as my, as my nickname, right? Mm-hmm. On so, um, to pay him tribute. But, but yeah, that, that was my cultural awakening. My cultural awakening was just realizing that people hate us for no reason at all. And I just felt the need to be able to tell stories to counter that. That's as simple as I can put it, but it's, it's a very, like I said, I'm all over the place with the story and I, and forgive me. Nah, but it's, a very, it's a very, um, it's a very emotional thing for me to talk about because it, it still impacts me to this day. We didn't get justice. They got away with it. Mm-hmm. Got away with it in my case. And they got away with, they got away with it for the most part with Michael Griffith as well, because the jail sentences they got didn't, weren't aligned with what they did. They took somebody's life. Yeah. yeah. So they're, li- they're living a whole life. They probably have families. They probably have businesses. They probably, you know, it was a it was a brief interruption of their life, but they interrupted Michael Griffith's life forever. And, and shout out to shout out to um, Michael Griffith's family and and Cedric Sandiford and, and all the, the folks that we met that night at the hospital. Um, but it was it was a tough it was it was a tough time, you know. Um, but but I I do think that that was a catalyst for me personally to to that led me into creating the platform that led me into the work that I do and just trying to to be the solution, to be the change for certain things that that plagued our community at the time. Yeah. And I mean, to, to start off, thank you uh, for sharing. You know, I know that's a hard thing to share, and I'm, I'm thankful that you're, you're open and willing to uh, share that. Uh, it's definitely something I think that obviously changed your life and, and thankfully changed it for the better. You know, yeah. um, you know, it, it, you, you're right about that catalyst. It, it, it drove you and you know i think like you mentioned before was one of the things that helped convince you that you you had what it took to go to college and and to make it from there um and so obviously you know if we change it up a little bit you know college you're you're in college and you said you focused and um you do you ended up graduating um as well oh the, the the funny thing is that um my career took a lot of crazy twists and turns mm-hmm. So I ended up dropping out of high school, getting my GED to get into college, to go to college and go all the way almost to the last year, almost the same way I did with, with high school and ended up dropping out of college. But not because I needed, not because of money or lack of or anything. It was actually the opposite. It was lack of time because I had been hustling at my job and really trying to get promoted and whatever. And I ended up getting a great promotion and I just couldn't afford to go to college anymore. From the perspective of not of, of financially paying to go to college, I couldn't afford the time. Mm-hmm. But I had at this point, I had two kids, and you know, it, they were my priority yeah. and the benefits and the whole nine yards. So I ended up dropping out of school because I was making more money than what the job in my degree would have provided me. Mm-hmm. Just didn't make sense, yeah. and I just never went back. Like I, you know, it's been an upward trajectory. Thankfully, it's been a blessing to to be in a position where I never had to look back. Mm-hmm. and to to feel like i needed to go back to school to make to make it work um and uh but you know but college did what it needed to do for me it built me it built me into a better man it made me a better friend it made me a better community leader uh it helped me experience a microcosm of society uh and and helped me make change in that space so that i could go ahead and take it outside and and everything about the platform that i created is really like me taking the the type of instruction and, and lessons that you learn in college, I was trying to bring that to the community that didn't have the 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 the, the opportunity to go to college. Yeah. Uh, in college, we do programming and we say, oh, we're going to do this with financial literacy. We're going to do this. We're going to talk about mental health. We're going to talk about all these different things. And, and these are programs that are meant to enhance the student perspective. I said to myself, like, why don't we have this? This is a conversation I had with one of my business partners, Papo, when we started our business way back when. I was like, why don't we have these conversations in the community where it's really needed? Like, the people coming here, they have a certain amount of privilege. They were able to come to college. They have some kind of money coming from somewhere, whether it's a loan or or a scholarship. 
Mm-hmm. What about the people that are out there that are really that there's life or death, right? The people who are making choices that could change their life forever based on their circumstance. So, so, so Frito for your soul was a little bit of that as well. It was, it was, it was the culture, it was the lessons and the stories, but it was also community action. It was, it was partnership. It was building things that didn't exist so that we could have a better experience in the community. So so tell me a little bit about Sofrito for Your Soul. Sofrito for Your Soul was a website that I created in my web design class at SUNY College at Westbury. It was a project. So I was only supposed to really design the look of it. It was supposed to be a, 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 like if you were going to create your own web platform, what would it it look like? I was in, uh, I was in class and I created this, this, you know, this interface with palm trees and Puerto Rico, like these warm orange and whatever colors. And I was like, so frito for your soul. And so frito for your soul at the end of the day is, is really a homage to my grandmother because she always talked about how different we were depending on where we were from in the island. And even when you were in the United States, how different we are from Mexicans and Colombians and Peruvians and Salvadorans, but we're still the same. Like we have common threads. So it made me think of sofrito, right? You got all these different ingredients that make one dish that's just phenomenal. Like, mm-hmm. right? It's, the, it's literally the, the the cornerstone of your dish. Mm-hmm. So I kind of made that analogy and I, I decided that sofrito for your soul would be the perfect name for a platform that would actually feed you knowledge and culture and, and just, you know, do show you things that actually will make you feel good. Yeah, and uh, when you develop that, um... Is that what were you? Is that what the job you left college for, or was that? Did you suit oh. another job to go to that one? No, no. So in in college, I worked at Kinkos, which is FedEx office today. Yeah, so I worked at Kinkos, which made me a great resource for the students at school. It was a great place to connect with people. It was a great place to learn to take my graffiti art and digitize it and create marketing materials for the frat. And for the organizations I belong to. So this was a breeding ground. This was like training. I was training to like create events, to network with people, to have access to resources. And computers weren't, um, you know, people didn't have computers in their homes at the time. Like this was a this was a yeah. time where people were just starting to get computers and you only had a computer in your house if you had dope. So so people came to Kinko's to use computers to web browse. They use it as an internet cafe to be able to check their emails. So this was like a destination. And I leveraged that destination and 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 got clients and started my own little hustle, like, you know, designing stuff for people. I designed stuff for like major brands at the time and they just wanted work. And it, I was cheap labor for them. They were just like, yo, come over here, just help me with this graphic real quick. And I would just, you know, I would be doing the work for Kinko's, but I would come to the side and just mm-hmm. do this real quick. Oh, 20 bucks. Yeah, cool. 50 bucks. Yeah. You know, so it was it was a, it was an interesting training round. Um, but it gave me access to computers, which helped me launch the website, right? Besides school, it was like school and Kinko's. So I would work on the website like 24 seven Kinko's was a 24 hour operation at the time. Mm-hmm. So I would work a lot of overnights just so I can get my work done, just so I can get my writing done, just so I could put out stuff in the world that actually would help people. So it was, it was a dope, it was a dope mix of like, you know, of resources that actually helped it happen, you know, but this is something that major companies were getting millions of dollars to develop websites. And here I am developing it with no money at all, just off of like side gigs and, and my own, my own cash, you know? So it was an interesting time. 97 to 2001 was a very interesting period. Uh, I, I remember Kinko's we used to go. Uh, I mean, you could tell just, I make myself sound old, but yeah, we, we used to have to go to Kinko's to print stuff out at night or make copies uh, or things. Or, the computers were there and, open 24 hours when you need to print that Absolutely. that last that last minute paper at one in the morning um that was kind of where you went uh and so how did you um convert your career from from that to kind of what you're doing now so the website was interesting because the website had me flourish as a i want you to know this though this is crazy mm-hmm. i being the first latino blogger is crazy because it took me like 10 years to even admit that i was a writer yeah, like you know, like I like in terms of like when you actually talk about your skill sets or whatever. I never considered myself a writer until like ten years ago. Mm-hmm. So, but but you know, I'm blogging, I'm covering events, I'm inviting people to events. My events are going 
viral at the time without social media. There's no social media back, back then. And it's like my events are going all over the place, all over Long Island. People knew about the website. People were going to it. I had people from the military in Germany, in, in Iraq, like, you know, writing into the website. Oh, my God, this is wonderful. I needed a recipe for Coquito. Like, you know, all this kind of, yeah, it's crazy. But, um, but it helped me connect with a lot of people. And it's so, it's so interesting that today, to this day, I'm connected with people that I met in 1997. When I first started the website, when it was brand new, when it was just one single page with a bunch of links, like it literally, uh, you know, I remember, uh, I remember those old school websites. So. Yeah. so then something changes. What, what makes it go into career mode is mi gente, mi gente oh, yeah. the play. So mi gente .com, for those of you who do not know, mi gente .com was a platform for Latinos built into a bigger company called Community Connect. Community Connect owned three websites. They owned Black Planet, Asian Avenue, and Mijente.com. The company was founded by three Asian guys. So this wasn't even a Latino website yeah. or a Black. It was, a, you know, it was an Asian company that came up with the concept. But it was everything that AOL used to be. And it was everything before MySpace. Yeah. It was literally four or five years before MySpace. So it was the, really the first social media network where you're messaging people, sending pictures, creating memes, creating graphics. Like it was literally all those things, but like three or four years before the media would call it the social media explosion. Mm -hmm. So we were over-indexing as Latinos on mihente.com in 2001, 2002. There was over anywhere between five to 10 million Latinos on the internet. In a time where nobody had handheld devices, in a time that laptops were almost unheard of, and you only had a desktop at home or you went to internet cafes. Mm -hmm. So I just to put that, put that in perspective. We were over-indexing on the internet back then. Okay? I, I remember I remember college, going, you know, you ran home to check your mi gente to, to see if someone hit you up or, you know, before you, because you couldn't go on your phone. You, there was nothing on your phone to look at. So there was no app. So yeah. Mi gente gave me a platform like no other, because I was already doing this work, mm -hmm. right? Now this platform is up here showing me that you have an audience. Like besides the people that found you, you know, there were no real search engines back then. The search engines were trash, but they were literally showing me that there was an audience out there for what I was doing. And then all these different companies started popping up that were doing events. And you had Latino Step, which was a Greek affiliated organization. Mm -hmm. And you had latinflavor.com and then you had boricuas.com and then you had, you know, PRDN or PRNY.com. Like all these different websites start coming up and they're all doing events. So I got deep into the event space. I had already done a little, a little side gigs as like a promoter doing clubs in the college circuit or whatever. I got knee deep. I got with Rafi Mercado. I got with uh, Rafi, um, uh, Rafi Mercado and RMM Music. And I started like, Yo, just let me invite backstage. Let me just interview somebody. I want to meet so and so. I want to, you know, be backstage. I'll take pictures. I'll put it on the website. And they didn't understand what it was. I was like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Do what you got to do. And I just started networking and networking and networking. And I'm going to tell you right now, I work with some of the biggest names in entertainment five years into the website, six years into the website. I'm doing branding for them. I'm designing album covers. I'm designing you know, uh, uh, flyers for, for parties. I'm doing banner ads. I'm doing all this stuff. And I just decided to monetize it. Just monetize that, monetize the advertising. We were the first website in the Latino space to have their own email. Like I literally partnered with a company and you can get sofritoforyoursoul.com email. Nice. Um, I partnered with a company called Bajio 305 that had this technology that nobody ever heard of that they could play videos on the website. I was, I was playing all the reggaeton videos, all the, the playero videos on my site, on a little TV, literally a little TV screen. I can show you a, a, a screenshot of it. Mm -hmm. It was a little TV screen and you could change the channels on it. It was, a, it was a script. And that company ended up selling for millions of dollars called Brightcove. Brightcove is one of the leading video like software engineers in the internet's history. Mm -hmm. But that little company was letting us use it just to promote reggaeton and like Latino hip hop videos mm -hmm. and freestyle videos. And that company ended up becoming huge. Yeah. But 
at it branded, we were just like, can we test out your software? Can we just, can we try to do this? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we did so many firsts. We actually helped curate the 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 Nassau County Museum of Art's first ever Latino um, art exhibit with Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera. Like we were involved in things that I would never dream of. And it just kept happening over and over again. And eventually I just said, you know what? Event production is the way to go. I need to really kind of funnel what's happening with the interest of what's happening here and bring people together off screen, mm -hmm. right? All, off the platform. Uh, so I started doing events and I ended up, uh, eventually I ended up partnering with my business partner from Capicu, Papo Santiago, Papo Swiggity, as he's known on, on Mi Gente. And we, uh, and we created something called Capicu Culture, which is basically, uh, it was a, a in-person, you know, a live cultural showcase where we featured poetry, live art. You know, we did this 16 years ago. Yeah. And, and, and the innovation just kept going because I kept saying to myself, like, I want to do radio, but nobody's going to give me a job in radio because I didn't get a degree in broadcasting. So Block Talk Radio came out and I said, I'm going to create a Latino talk show. And I did it, you know, I was telling you before we, we, we got on here, I did a talk show. We did over 70 episodes. Mm -hmm. And then we even sold the show to Urban Latino Radio. And we did a show with them. You know, like we were able to grow this media property by just creating it and not asking for permission. Mm -hmm. So I just kept building and building and building. And I kept doing this with that company and that with that company. And let me, let me figure out how to do this live. And let me figure out how to get this video and, and get the editing done. Even though I don't have the, the, I don't have the equipment who can I, whose equipment can I borrow? Can I go into this TV station? My boy works there as a producer. Can I go in there for three hours and just cut it up on Adobe Premiere? Like I was just hustling the relationships just to get access. Now it's crazy. We have all the access right here. Yeah. Everything that I was hustling to find, everything I had to negotiate, everything I had to like con people into giving me access to is all on my phone now. Mm -hmm. I could do everything on the phone. But it wasn't like that back then. No. So, so. So I take pride in that, that, that pioneering element of we did everything the hard way, which when the easy way came, we were just able to grow even more. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the kind of, that's the one thing I, I would say I take the most pride in is that we did it the hard way. And then when the easy way came, we learned how to do it that way too. But the work ethic stayed the same and the work ethic just basically got stronger because now I have more time because I'm able to do it easier. I have technology that makes me do it, that allows me to do it quicker and faster. So now I can go ahead and use that time to build something else. Mm -hmm. And I just kept, I've been doing the same thing for 27 years. It's step and repeat, step and repeat, step and repeat. You know? So that's, that's kind of where, where that comes from. So it was, a, it was an interesting time. The internet in the 90s into 2000s was a very, very interesting time. Well, I think, you know, looking back on that, none of us thought of where we'd be today with the way technology was compared to like how we were doing things back then and how much, I mean, I, I did, I started doing graphic design in high school because um, I was in a program called Upward Bound that let us stay on campus um, at a local college at Rhode Island College. And we were in a computer room and one of the kids there, and a, a, a shout out to, uh, uh, Josh Zapata, uh, he was kind of like, oh, uh, I'm just doing stuff on Photoshop. I'm like, what's Photoshop? And I'm like, oh, what? it's this program. And he and we had access to it in the lab. So I was like, all right, let me learn how to do Photoshop. And then I taught myself how to pirate Photoshop up to my computer. And then I started, and the same thing, college, I was doing graphic design for all all the frats and uh, all our frat parties and all our events. So it's, it's, you know, you have to try okay. to hustle to get that. And now it's like my daughter is doing graphic design and video editing and she's 10 <laughs> on her iPad. And, you and know? She's, doing it, and she's doing it at the level that you couldn't do it oh. with the best tools in the industry. Yeah. You, you know, know what I'm saying? Yeah. She's like, I'm going to, I'm going to start my YouTube channel. I'm going to do this. I'm like, Go ahead, baby. Uh, you know, whatever else you need. She's, you know, so yeah. It, yeah, it's just crazy to think of like how many, uh, uh, you know, hurdles you had to jump with just to get the basics down back in the day. And now it's just like, oh my God. And so like, speaking of that, you know, I mean, obviously things are completely different now. You know, what, yeah. what, are, what are still some of those challenges, especially for like Latinos who are trying to build 
um, you know, what you call, you know, social storytelling and, and, and getting into digital media. So, so now the biggest challenge is the perception of the people who make decisions in the media space. We're fighting for representation. We're way behind other groups that have managed to, to solidify their own leaders in the space. You know, the black community has done great in making their own films and producing and financing their own films and other content, other, other, other media content. Um, I think that we're a little behind in that. And I think that part of the reason why we're a little behind in the content space is because I think that we're doing a lot more infighting than we need to. There's a lot of gatekeeping. There's a lot of people who are not willing to collaborate with others because they're afraid that they're going to surpass them. And that's the one thing about me, anybody who ever worked with me, anybody who knows me, I, I'll give you the keys, bro. I'll give you the keys to the house. Like if I learn how to do something, I'm going to show you all the tools. I'm going to show you all the ways that you could do it because I understand that what Raul's going to do is not going to be what I'm going to do. So you could excel in your own space. You could actually be your the leader in your own space. And I could be a leader in my space and we could probably overlap and collaborate. But I don't need to feel, I don't need to be threatened by you. I don't need that, you know, and that's not, that's not what I see in the space. And actually, interestingly enough, there was a time that it opened up and people were really starting to collaborate and things were happening. And then with things like the pandemic or whatever, I think, I think things have stepped backwards. So I think we're back in that space where everybody's gatekeeping, everybody's not putting people on, they're not sharing, not, they're not saying their names in the rooms that they're not in, like, you know, things like that. It's just, it's really holding us back. And I feel like there's a small army of people out there that are doing the right thing. And, and I, and I want to shout them out. People like Nikki Saunders, um, people like Nancy Ruffin, you know, people who I connect with on a regular basis, they're, they're definitely doing their thing. But there's a lot of people who are not. And that's, that's kind of holding us back. So the challenges are really ourselves first. And then obviously the people who make decisions in these media companies that are not seeing our work. Even though the market space has grown, even though we have trillions and trillions of dollars in buying power, even though the audiences are overwhelmingly Latino, we're going to be 25% of the country in just a couple of short years. Like it's all these things, like given, we're still not in our rightful place in the media in terms of perception, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, overcoming stereotypes. And, and, you know, it's just not fair. It's just not, you know, it's not fair. But only we could change that. We need Latinos to invest in their own projects. We need them to find their own way. Just like I found my way through developing a website, creating a marketing agency, creating a, a, a podcast. In 2004, 2005, I had a podcast that was weekly and eventually made it to an internet station with, with actual validity, with, a, with, actual, with an actual audience. Um, so we need the creators from today to use all these tools to make their projects as good as possible so that we can make it easy for the decision makers. But then once we get put on, we need to be the decision makers. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, well, what's it called? It's, uh, what they always say, it, even from the big guy, there's always somebody else above them writing that check. You know, we got to be that guy writing those checks. You know, and, we gotta be the, so, you know, so people that are in that space right now, America Ferreira, uh, Jennifer Lopez, Luis Guzman, um, you know, this there's, there's some of Rosario Dawson. Those are people that are in the media that have done amazing work as creators, as artists, as protagonists. You know, they've done they've done their thing. Mm -hmm. But now what can they do to put on the next generation? What can they invest in to put on the next generation to make sure that we have more more of those sto stories told? So this is all storytelling from, from, from everything I ever done is all storytelling. At the end of the day, nothing's changed. I'm just telling the stories in different ways, using different technologies, but it's, it's still the same thing. Mm -hmm. Our stories are not out there to the level they need to, but shout out to people again, like, you know, Angie Abreu, who has dominicanwriters.com. She's out there making sure that the Dominican voices are heard. Right. So we need those, we need those people to like really get out there and, and create these projects so that we can multiply it and actually, you know, get to the place where we need to be. If there's no books, there can't be no films about our story. We need the books to get to the film, right? We need the podcast to create the programs. We're creating the dialogue through the podcast, but the podcast creates the dialogue that eventually becomes programs and things that people need. So it's, it's a step, but it all starts with story. Yeah. It all starts with story.
Yeah. And, it, and it's, you know, when you, when you said something like about, you know, we got to get to those level where we're making those decisions, you know, and then I'm thinking of like, that's, you know, it's like, like what Tyler Perry's doing. You know what I mean? He's trying to create his own studio, his own production company. And, 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 and actually very interesting. Tyler Perry, Tyler Perry's an interesting guy because, you know, he bought that whole lot and he created his studio. Yeah. But he did something that a lot of people don't give him credit for. He had a business partner named Ozzy Abreu. And he went to Ozzy and he says, you see that lot right next door? That's yours. I want you to create what I'm creating for black people. I want you to create for Latinos. Right. And that's something, and you know, and, and we're still seeing some of those projects trickle in or whatever, yeah. but, but that was him saying, you know what? You could do the same thing I'm doing. That's, mm -hmm. that's the kind of support we need in our community. Mm -hmm. It's looking at us and saying, I believe in you. I invest in you. And he sponsored that. He said, yo, I want you to do what I'm doing for my people. I want you to do for your people. I can't do it. Yeah. But I'm invested in this side of it. But I can help you. I could invest in you. I could go ahead and, and you know, so so that to me is dope. That's the, that's the kind of person I would want to be if, in, that, in that position. That's, the, that's, that's who I would be. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm a big believer of um, if, if we elevate each other, we all elevate together you know what i mean like it's not there's no point of you know, i don't need to go and feel like uh you can't get higher than me and you can't be bigger than me you know like uh, i used to be a counselor for upward bound um and i had kids that were high school um, uh, one of the things that kind of drove me and ultimately to get here i was like you know i always want to do something for high school kids and all my high school kids are, are college graduated kids getting successful lives. some of, a lot of some of them more successful than i am you know and it's just like um, I love to see that happen. So you know, Listen, I think I think Tupac said it best. Mm -hmm. There was there was an interview he did like before he passed, and oh boy, he was killed. Let me let me not take away from the fact that he was killed, but he said, "I may not change the world, but I'm gonna spark the brain of the person who does." And that's that's what everything I'm working on now, like the new the new generation of what I'm doing right now, with Siembra Academy. That's exactly what it is for me. It's planting seeds so that I can create a foundation for other people to do, to take over the work, right? To, 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 to build on the legacy. And that's what I feel like I'm doing right now. This is my legacy lab, so to speak. So you mentioned uh, Siembra Academy. Uh, can you tell me what that is? Yeah, Siembra Academy was a project that I was going to launch in 2024. I, it was a long-term goal of mine to launch it. And it ended up happening by accident, right? The pandemic happened, the shutdown happened. And I had a bunch of people that were, um, I had a bunch of people who were losing their jobs, didn't know what they were going to do. They were stuck at home. And all of a sudden there was a, a, a deep interest in making sure that people got educated on things that uh, emerging technology, they had to learn how to use Zoom. They had to learn how to work remotely. Um, but a lot of them were thinking about like, what if my job never comes back? Like, what am I going to do? Some people wanted to be authors. Some people wanted to start nonprofits. Other people wanted to create a podcast. Like all these different people had these ideas that they said, this is my chance. I never had time. And now I'm home and I have nothing but time. Let me try to make that dream come true. So that group, um, so I ended up opening up the doors to a Facebook group that ended up with about seven people to start with. And I started having classes. And then next thing you know, people were like, yo, my friend is also doing something like what I'm doing. Can they come in or whatever? The group grew to 241 nice. people. So for a period of almost two years, I gave them free coaching. I made accessible different tools to them. I coached them on like marketing and branding and taught them how to use social media more effectively. Uh, I talked to them in private about their ideas and their plans to help them get the resources they need and connected them with people that I knew. And this whole Siembra initiative got started. So then I started thinking about it. I'm like, what's next, right? Like, what's really next for me? And after years of doing really flashy, influencer, kind of marketing bro type stuff, I said to myself, the marketing space is not healthy right now. It's not healthy because it's, people are not really growing. There was recently a study that was done that they said that less than 10% of influencers make over $50,000 a year. People who are full-time, who consider themselves full-time creators don't even make $50,000 a year. And we're virtually inv in, invisible in a space that's almost $500 billion in growth. Mm -hmm. So think about that. Nobody's making money, 
but the agencies, right? And the big brands, they're making the money and we're not. So, so entrepreneurship is going through this really weird space where people are more concerned about who's behind them, who's following them, as opposed to turning around and speaking to them. Mm -hmm. That to me is a problem. That's not healthy. So I, uh, I've, I've retooled and revisited what my original mission statement was for Siembra is to create healthy, sustainable businesses for creators, for people who are creative that have impact projects. And I decided to implement a couple of new things, right? A mental health aspect. And also I wanted to make sure that what we were doing was dismantling hustle culture because hustle culture is not healthy. Hustle culture makes people make bad decisions. They do things that are unethical. They're not disclosing their FTC disclosures, right? They're not telling people that they're selling them something because they're making some money from it. And that, that diminishes the trust in the creators and the influencers that are working the space. And if that happens, then I can't make money. Then the agencies can't make money because people don't trust us. So my, my goal is to take entrepreneurs that want to create impact in the space. They want to do they want to do good things. They want to make money. They want to make a living. They want to advance their career and develop new shit. And my thought process is let me teach them how to dismantle this hustle culture or, re or reformat it, right? Or re reframe it, if you will, to something that's more healthy, to something that actually takes into account that they're human beings, that have families, that have ambitions, that have personal relationships that they need to nurture. They can't be buried into this digital space 24-7. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. I applied for funding recently. Um, I have a, another podcast interview coming up on a nationally syndicated show in a couple of weeks um, that, that's going to address this in a more formal way, like talk about deeply about what the hustle culture is and, and how we need to overcome it. And, uh, and I'm kind of like shifting the conversation, you know, um, on the passionate side, right? Besides the hustle culture conversation, in terms of like business and entrepreneurship, I, it, I'm also deeply rooted and deeply invested in a conversation about men's mental health in general, mm -hmm. regardless of what you do for a living, whether you're a cop, a fireman, if you're a janitor, it doesn't matter. Like I want to have conversations with men about, uh, about their uh, feelings. I want to have conversations. I want to create spaces where they can feel free to have conversations that are going to lead to either therapy or to support in some way, shape, or form, so that we could unlearn a lot of the behaviors that we need to unlearn and become healthier men. So that's kind of where I'm at with that right now. Um, I created, I've, I've been playing around with ChatGPT, and ChatGPT gave developer access to people who have the Plus account. Uh, so I just created an AI bot called Green Hoodie Project, which is the project that I'm naming it. Um, they recreated the Green Hoodie Project as a as a place or as a platform to have conversations about mental health. Uh, so the app specifically finds resources for men, for black and Latino men to be specific, for yes. men of color. Um, so so we, you know, we're training the AI app to, to look for certain uh, cues, for social cues. We're training it to be empathetic. We're training it to have conversations about personal harm, you know, uh, um, suicide and things of that nature. Um, so where I programmed it for multiple languages, which is English, Spanish, and Creole so far. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm developing the app so that once there exists a tool that will take chat GPT apps and make them available on cell phones and things of that nature, then we can make that transition and make the app available to people. I want to make sure that the app is free. I want to make sure that the app is ad free. Like it's not going to be sold as a commodity. It's not going to be sold for advertising. It's going to be used for what it's used for. And that's to change lives and hopefully save lives. Nice. Yeah. It's a, um, I had a conversation with a buddy this weekend. Uh, you know, mental health came up and, uh, you know, he gave me a pretty good quote. He's like, you know, you don't, you don't get your oil change on your car to fix your car. You take an oil change your car to keep it running. And he's like, I, I don't go to a therapist to fix myself. I go to my a therapist to keep me running, to maintain myself. It's like, you yeah. know, change that mindset that we always had where you only go to a therapist because something is bad that needs to be fixed, you know, for, for a lot of us. That's everything. That's what regular health, right? Mm -hmm. We don't go to, to the hospital unless we're fucking dying. Like, yep. it's, it's that sad, but that's is what really happens, right? Mm -hmm. um, but with mental health, we can't. We can't afford to do that with mental health. And I'm going to tell you why. There's so many people in our periphery 
there's people around us that are impacted by whatever trauma we're carrying. You know, our children, our siblings, our family members, our parents, or, you know, everybody, your coworkers, they're all impacted in some way, shape or form by the behaviors that we do as men that shouldn't happen, right? So we need to get the tools to be able to deal with whatever we're dealing with, whatever baggage we're dealing with, so that we could actually live happier lives. And that's that's the goal. The goal of this project is for men to live happier lives. So the Green Hoodie Project comes from Encanto, the movie, the Disney movie Encanto. Yeah. So when the movie came out, there was a lot of conversation about Bruno. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not gonna say any spoilers, even though the movie came out mad long ago. But basically, Bruno wore this green hood. You know, he wore this this poncho, you know, a hooded poncho. Uh, and he had all these, he had family trauma, right? He had like relationship issues with his family and he was outcast. Long story short, we're having the same conversation. So I thought it would be helpful for men to wear green hoodies as a symbol of it's okay to talk, take the hood off and kind of like talk about how you feel. Uh, and the hood, the hoodie, besides being the Bruno connection or whatever, the hoodie is very significant in our culture, right? If you grew up in, in, in any inner city, the hoodie was like your uniform. It was like, you know, that's how you act hard. And, you know, there's certain machismo behind the hoodie, you know, that we have, you know, going all the way back to hip hop days, you know? So the hoodie to me is like a very big symbol. The green is symbolizing growth. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's siembra. It's, 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 it's just like, you know, siembra. So, so I think the Green Hoodie Project has some legs. I, I feel like I want to really explore it. I've, I've had conversations with amazing uh, mental health professionals that, that think it's a good idea that want to invest some time and, and, and possibly even money into it. So, so it's happening again. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to keep it a hundred besides playing with the technology. I know I have an idea and I know that I'm going to find 10 people who are smarter than me to take my idea and make it a reality right. is what I've done countless times before in the media business. Mm -hmm. So this is not about me. I'm not a genius. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to figure out all the things. I'm going to find people that I know that I could trust that are going to help me get it to where I wanted to get it. And that's, that's really, at the end of the day, that's what I'm trying to do. Awesome. Look, Power collaboration. Yeah. No, uh, it's the, uh, I think uh, for a long time I was of the, I have great ideas, but I was afraid to make moves for it. And now, now I, I'm a big believer. It's like, you know, Put, put, some say, fire in that, put some fire in that pan and get to work. You know what I mean? I want to be very clear. I want to be very, very clear. If anybody's out there that's listening to this podcast right now has the means to do what I'm doing better and faster, please do it. I don't care. This is not a business for me. This particular project is not a business for me. This is not a business idea. I'm not buying equity into it. I'm not trying to get rich off of it. I'm not trying to sell it. I'm not trying to, 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 to use it for an advertising platform like I've done with my other businesses. This is something for the community. It belongs to the community. I want to create it so that it exists. And if you could make it faster than me, if you can actually create this and make it better than I can make it, or if you want to come and join me to make it better, like I'm open to all things. Mm -hmm. This is not about me. This is not about, it's about planting the seed so that we can have something that's going to benefit and save lives. That's yeah. At the end of the day, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's awesome, man. And uh, you know, so I, usually around this time, I start wrapping things up. You know, I, I usually come around and ask a couple questions and on all the podcasts and stuff. So, you know, I, I think the first one is usually for me is like you know your journey's been amazing and it's long and you've gone through so much stuff. Um, you know, if, if you were able to go back and give yourself some advice, you know, what's something you'd tell yourself? I don't know because. If I actually made a decision on what to say to myself that would actually change the course of my life, that means that something will not happen as a result. And I don't know if I'm willing to, to alter what I've done because I feel like I made a difference. You know, I feel like the stuff that I went through, even the trauma, even the really the heavy bullshit, it actually worked for somebody else. It worked out. So I don't think that I would, you know, there's a couple of things that from a vanity perspective that you think you would say, mm -hmm. but I don't think that I would change anything. I think that I would let it rock just the way it was. All right. Nice, man. And, uh, and I think ultimately, you know, the namesake of this show, you know, how do you say success in Spanglish? Oh, man, this might be controversial, though. Go ahead. Can I, can I curse? Yeah, of course. You cursed already. 
<laughs> yeah, I did, right? Yeah. <laughs> a lo foque. Mm-hmm. A lo foque. Like, just do it, man. Just get it done. Like, that's success to me. You know, mm-hmm. just get it done. Like, like, done is better than perfect. Yep. I've heard that so many times from so many really brilliant people uh, that I've worked with. Is done is better than perfect. Don't ask for permission. Uh, uh, what is it? Don't ask for permission. Just apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Better to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, alofoque is how I say success in Spanglish. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I mean, when I was doing this podcast, I was very much stuck on that perfect. I need perfect. I was, you know, it took me about that. Yeah, it took me like four months just to get the logo I wanted and the color scheme and the ideas. And I didn't. And then I just said, fuck it. I need to start recording. I need to start recording because if I don't record and my first few episodes were rough and things have gotten better, a lot better since then. But it's, you know, I, I agree. You know, if, if I didn't do it, just start doing it as shitty as I could, I would never have gotten to it. And now, you know how many people I know that have amazing podcast ideas mm-hmm. and sitting on them for years, sitting on them. I have a couple of friends that I bet I managed to push a little bit to get them going, but there's so many people with good ideas and they're just holding on to it. it and then, and then the worst part about that, and, and I know we got to wrap up, but the worst part about that is holding on to an idea so long that somebody else does it mm-hmm. and they do it half ass or or not as good as you could do it mm-hmm. and they find an incredible success as a result. Yeah. Even though you could have done it better, even though you had a better idea, even though you had the better connections, even though you had the funding, whatever it is, but they actually did it. And because they did it, people are like, oh my God, you did it. We've been waiting for this. This is, take my money, take my money. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, you've been sitting on that idea for five, six years. That's that hurts, bro. Yeah, that hurts. It's happened to me. I, I'm talking from experience. Mm-hmm. It's happened to me. When you hold on to something so long that somebody else does it half ass, and then you have to watch them get all the glory. And meanwhile, you've been sitting on that. It's in your notebooks. You sketched it out. You've actually done test runs. You've done all this stuff, and it doesn't mean anything because they did it. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's it, bro. No, I agree, man. And 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 George, thank you so much. Uh you're you've had an amazing journey. I really appreciate you taking the time out to be here. Um is there anything um anything else you'd like to plug before we, we close up? No. Like I said, if you have a way to to impact mental health for men and you want to take my ideas and run with them, that I doy. Here we go. I mean, if you can make it happen, that I doy. Awesome, bro. Well, uh thank you so much. Um and for everyone else listening in as well, I appreciate you know the support as always, and I hope you join me again next time as we continue to learn how to say success in Spanglish. Alofoque!